Senator Ed Markey declared victory last night. He was defeating Representative Joe Kennedy's primary challenge in Massachusetts. Following his victory, the incumbent senator provided remarks thanking his campaign staffers and supporters. Let's take a listen. This campaign has always been about the young people of this country. You are our future. And thank you for believing in me because I believe in you. And if we all keep believing together, we just get, may get my sneakers to last another eight weeks on the campaign trail. <laughs> But Kennedy's powerful endorsements, including from House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, were not enough to stop Markey from having a decisive victory. And here's what he had to say following that loss. To my family, the Kennedy family, whose name was invoked far more often than I anticipated in this race. To my mom, my dad, my twin brother, and the rest of a rowdy bunch of crazy cousins. You all are my heroes. You are my role models. You are my example of what public service should be and can be when it is done with courage and grit. Thank you for teaching me everything I know. D.C. Bureau Chief of the Intercept, Ryan Grimm, has been closely following this race and also the other races that went down in Massachusetts last night. Great to have you, Ryan. Good to see you, Ryan. Good to see you. Mm -hmm. So talk about the significance of this Markey Kennedy fight, because it's easy to like take it for granted now. Markey's the incumbent. He pushes back this insurgent challenge. At the beginning of this race, the threat to Markey was considered so dire, people were actually wondering if he was going to just step aside to let Joe Kennedy have this seat. So talk about what some of the broader implications and lessons are from this race. Right. It, it's impossible to know what would have happened had had Markey gone down a more traditional path. But I think we can make some e educated guesses. L like you said, the, the polling very, very early on when Joe Kennedy announced that he was going to run had Markey trailing significantly to him. You know, he there were even a, a, a non-trivial number of Massachusetts voters who had no idea who Markey was, despite the fact that he'd been in elected office in the state since the 1970s. <laughs> uh, but what Markey had going for him was that though he has a spotty record on uh, some on policing issues, he voted for the Iraq war, even though he thought it was a, a mistake. Uh, he was he was to the right of Nancy Pelosi at times throughout his career in the House of Representatives. He's always been good on climate and the environment. And in, in 2007, for instance, you know, he was the one who chaired the, the select committee on on the environment. And then he was the co-author of, of Waxman Markey, which was the most, uh, you know, there are a lot, there are a lot of uh, criticisms of it, but it was the most significant effort to combat climate change ever to make it through the, the House of Representatives. And, and it ended up dying over in the Senate. So he he's not a convert on the on the question of of climate change and his decision to follow that up by endorsing and not just endorsing the Green New Deal, but giving Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez a Senate sponsor, a lead sponsor of her resolution very early on in uh, in in 2019 really changed, uh, really changed the mm. game for him because it, it, it put him kind of in the in the mode of a Bernie Sanders without the, the history of a Bernie Sanders. Yeah, let me ask you this, though, Ryan. I mean, I saw this from Dave Wasserman, which is basically Ed Markey, you know, despite all the progressive talk here, he won because of Whole Foods voters and because of young, like, white kids in college towns. So blue-collar workers actually mostly supported Joe Kennedy, or they're now Republicans in the state of Massachusetts. Is there a lesson to be learned there for some of this? Well, I mean, that is effectively the insurgency. You know, right. I've, I've always said, and I, and I argue in my book, that if if the if the left is going to take over the Democratic Party, it's going to have to be a, a coalition effectively of Sanders voters and, and Warren voters. Uh, nobody really wants to hear that uh, because, <laughs> you know, no, nobody wants to think that they have to, like, team up with their mom to go and win. Uh, but that, that, that's you know, that's what it took in, in Massachusetts. The, those two camps uh, put put their differences from the, the primary aside and, and rallied behind Markey. And so, that, you know, that's that's why you had this this coalition 
of of young people and kind of uh, you know re- resistance adults in their uh, in 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 what Wasserman calls whole whole foods districts, whatever mm-hmm. others have called Panera districts, but that that is a that is a majority coalition uh, inside the Democratic Party, and you know once you have started to establish that that uh, that authority within the party, you're going to start winning over both uh, white, black, and brown uh, working class voters because it's it's not as if. Uh, those voters uh, oppose ideas like Medicare for all. It's, sure. it's, it's that th- their their relationship with the party is different than that of a than that of a student or, or their mother. Mm. Yeah, that's an, a really interesting point. I do want to say my mom did not really care for Elizabeth Warren, so let's just put that on the table. <laughs> um, <laughs> what does this mean for Nancy Pelosi? I played this out yesterday of her explaining that she backed Kennedy. I mean, just like brazenly admitting it's because she's like friends with the family and I served with this one and I was an intern for that one and my dad was the campaign chair for JFK or whatever. Um, she jumped into this race it opened up sort of Pandora's box because she's been holding the line or trying to on we can't endorse in primaries. What does the fact that she is now associated with the first ever Kennedy loss in the state of Massachusetts mean? Yeah, th- there was kind of like a, a how dare you kind of attitude to her her endorsement. You know, how, how, how dare you, you know, insult the legacy of the of the great Kennedy clan. But her her entry into the race has its own implications, which means all bets are off on on primaries going forward. The the moral authority of the DCCC to to blacklist or to come down on any anybody who endorses primary challengers at this point is severely undercut by Nancy Pelosi and Steny Hoyer's decision to get into a race a challenging in, in a long time incumbent. Pelosi served for more than 25 years with Ed Markey in the House of Representatives. So, you know, the, the idea that, that that there's some now some solemnity to incumbency is is out the window at this point. But the fact that uh, that she came in and was so unable to to move voters certainly you know undercuts her her national stature among uh, among Democratic primary voters, among the kind of activist base of voters who people believe, you know, have this kind of yes queen attitude towards Nancy Pelosi. And certainly in polls, you'll, uh, you know, you'll find, you know, 70, 80 percent support for Pelosi. But what it shows is that that support is soft. You know, they 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 want mm-hmm. Nancy Pelosi to be the speaker. Uh, they they support her generally. But that's that's kind of as far as they're going to go with that. Yeah, I think that's interesting. Ryan, at the same time, of course, it to turn to a race um, which we spent a lot of time covering here on Rising, and that was Alex Morris versus Richie Neal. Looks like Richie Neal won there. What are some of the lessons that you're drawing away from the Neal victory? Why did things turn out the way that they did? He won quite sizable, as far as I can tell. Right. Well, there are, there are a couple things that you can take away. One is that uh, you, you can't take away any, anything because of the way that it unfolded in in the past, in, you know, in the, in the three weeks after the college Democrats accused him, uh, you know, effectively of of being a predator and turned the race from what had been a, a referendum on Neil and Neil's style of government, which is raise a lot of corporate money, amass power in Washington, and then and then pledge that you will use that power that you've accrued in Washington to the benefit of the district. And so the the race had been fought along those lines for the, for the, the 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 preceding year with with more saying uh, you know, he hasn't used his power to benefit the district his, his tagline was something like uh, you know Richard Neal knows how Washington works but I want to change Washington and with with Richard Neal countering I've delivered back home so that mm-hmm. was the question that that voters were wrestling with you know are we going to lose too much power by getting rid of Richard Neal? relative to the power that we'll gain by having somebody who's part of the squad who's going to back Medicare for all, but who's going to back the Green New Deal and who's going to try to transform an economy that has utterly failed much, you know, all of central and western Massachusetts that isn't vacation homes owned by Blackstone executives. Right. That that question went out the window when the race instead became about Alex Morris's sex life. Uh, and, and Richard Neal's uh, backers never led up on that charge, even after it was exposed to be this kind of orchestrated fraud. They, they can his backers, his super PAC, you know, continued running ads accusing him of, of effectively of having consensual sex, but basically reminding 
uh, voters, not just that that there's an that he ha that he holds the identity of a gay person, but he also is gay and acts gay and does 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 these gay things. And, and, mm -hmm. and he and, and they moved and they moved the conversation, you know, away from identity where it was, you know, during, say, the the, the Pete Buttigieg campaign into a place that kind of uh, plucked the 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 heartstrings of home of latent homophobia in a lot of uh, voters mm -hmm. in that in that district. And I think that's what that that's what helped shape the the gap in the race. You know, you because internal polling that that Morse had found that even once voters learned that this was an a fraud and an orchestrated smear, one in five of them still said after hearing it they were more likely to support Richard Neal. You know, the the scandal drove up Morse's Morse's negatives and you know moved a lot of people who might have been persuadable away from him. Now, we, we don't know if, well, and, and we'll never know if this cycle was one that, that an insurgent like Morse was going to be able to beat Neil. Neil spent, you know, he, Neil and his super PAC spent more than $5 million on this race. He's, he's an effective politician. He's not somebody who took this for granted. He's, he's been a, a, a well-known and popular figure in the area. And it's not the kind of metropolitan district where Justice Democrats uh, candidates have done so well in the past. So we'll never yeah. know if if absent this this three weeks of talking about Morse's sex life that, uh, you know, that he would have been able to close the gap or not. And finally, Ryan, there was an open primary to fill Joe Kennedy's uh, vacated con congressional seat. So not only did he not make it into the Senate, he had to give up his congressional seat in order to run. Um, at least when I was looking this morning, it looked like that one was unsettled. Can you talk about the dynamics there and whether or not we know who the ultimate victor was? It, it looks like, uh, you know, pending perhaps a recount, that Jake Auchincloss is is going to ride the Boston Globe's endorsement to victory with with just roughly 23 percent of the of the vote, um, narrowly edging out uh, a, a, a progressive uh, Jesse Murmel, who had the endorsement of Ayanna Presley. But the, the squad was split in this race with Ilhan Omar uh, backing Asan Lecky, who I finished with something like 13 percent of the vote. Plus, there were a number of other progressive candidates who also got around 13, 14 percent of the vote. So the, the, the Boston Globe coming in and backing a, a right wing, uh, very recently Republican uh, 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 council member from from nearby mm -hmm. uh, seems seems to be enough. And, and ironically, the Auchincloss's are kind of linked with the, the Kennedy family. He's mm. he's related to Jackie Onassis. He's He's related uh, also to Gore Vidal. It's, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, this is, this is Massachusetts. It's, I guess that's how they do it. Uh, um, now, the question, the, the question, the question would be, will they, will they, will they run a write-in campaign? Say, we don't need a Republican um, in this seat. You could even have, uh, I, I don't think Kennedy would do it, but he would probably win a write-in campaign um, against Auchincloss. The, the Boston Globe um, endorsement, though, appears to have, have played a pivotal role here in this hmm. race. Interesting. That's interesting. The Kennedy Ryden possibility yeah. is also intriguing. Um, Ryan, thank you. So Thanks, great Ryan. to have you. Appreciate it. You got it. I will have more rising for you after this.